So I'd like to say hello to everyone that's participating. And I'm really thrilled. I'm Carol Waller. I'm the executive director of the Type Directors Club. And it's just so nice to see um, all our judges here today, people that I've worked with over all these years, um, all these experts in type design. So I am going to give you over right away to Zenia. Some are, some are, I can't. <laughs> I can't <figure laughs> <You don't> <laughs> Okay. I don't need to do that at all. Um, yeah, I'm Ksenia Samarska. I'm a strategist and creative practitioner. And this year I have the honor of chairing the TDC's face design competition. Um, I've been, uh, I was a judge for this competition a couple of years ago. And out of all the competitions I've judged, it delivers the most thorough work. Um, it delivers a really high quality of work. It was really tough to judge. Um, so I'm really excited to get to participate in this again. And um, also, if you're watching this, it's you still have time to submit your entries and um, turn something in. So stick around. Uh, listen to all the panelists and all the people judging here tonight, uh, ask them questions. You can send questions through the Q and A, which I will figure out how to answer um, or get the judges to answer. And I will now let the judges introduce themselves. Peter, you wanna start? Hi, uh, my name is Peter Bilak. I work in this pink space here in The Hague uh, in the Netherlands. Um, I run a type foundry called Typotech, uh, and I've been always working with text, uh, and text has different faces, of course, so I work with content, publishing, and of course, type design as well. Um, I uh, teach part-time, uh, well, this year it's going to be 20 years since I've been teaching in type of media at the Royal Academy of Arts in The Hague. Um, yeah, and I work with all different aspects of design, uh, which is quite wide discipline. Um, well, we'll get to talk about it later. Hi, my name is Ryoko Nishizuka. I'm working here at Adobe as principal type designer at Tokyo, Japan. Uh, this is past six o'clock in the morning. I'm glad I got up. Uh, perhaps the best known my work is first hand sense, also known as not sans shijike. This font can be used, used with the same design as Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and English, and I was able to create it with many products. In Japan, also make fonts of various styles, such as brush letter, cute shapes, and uh, usual ones. Thank you. Noel, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is uh, Noel Loy. I'm currently based in Lucerne, Switzerland, where also the Type Foundry, Grilly Type, of which I'm a co-founder, is based. Um, it's a small city, not for Swiss standards, but for international standards here at Lake Lucerne. And i um, been spending the bigger part of this last year gazing at the lake and designing typefaces and managing the foundry. I'm very happy to be here and I, I want to thank you all who organized this event. I'm happy to talk to so many interesting people tonight. Oh, right. Um, hi, my name is Ajay Archer. I'm a designer in Trinidad. I, uh, have a studio that does a lot of web work, a lot of identity work, a lot of it focused around typography. And probably for the past three or four years, I've been drawing type. Um, I've been doing work for custom type, but also working on a project for Dave over at Google. And trying to, I think this year, I've spent a lot less time drawing and a lot more time questioning around type. So I think that's really what I'm doing right now is questioning why am I drawing? And what, uh, why am I drawing the things that I'm drawing? But um, I'm really happy to be here. It's it's always kind of interesting to end up in these spaces. Um, so today I'm kind of looking forward to having conversations about type and maybe just some of the ways that we think about it as well. 
Hi everyone, my name is Nadine Shahin. I am a Lebanese type designer. I lived in Germany for a, quite a bit of time and then London. Currently I'm in Barcelona for the last few months until the pandemic is over, <laughs> hopefully one day. Um, I, uh, I design typefaces. I am the principal in my family, Arabic type. Um, and I also do legibility research um, in, for Latin, Arabic and Chinese. And recently I completed a, a master's in international relations from Cambridge. So I'm always interested in how type is talking to other disciplines and the interesting intersections that we can find in that. Hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is Sandra Garcia. I am from Colombia, but I currently live in Mexico City. I belong to the Tipa Style Collective, and we are a typographic design studio. I am a teacher, and uh, recently I have been immersed in the launch of our most recently book, Element Type. So thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone. Um, not sure if we want to, uh, when we were messaging before this and I was asking everyone what they've been, what you guys have all been up to, everyone here has also had a ridiculously productive year. Like you guys also seem to have like been doing so much this year. Do you also want to go around and just say some of the, about any of the projects that you're working on now or that you've recently launched or released? I can start. I am... Um... I live in Trinidad, which is um, a small island a little north of Venezuela in the Caribbean. And when the coronavirus started taking effect, because so, of, so much of our industry is brick and mortar, we had this kind of a boom of work for like e-commerce websites. And my studio got a lot of work requests. And I, um, I think that I was in a place where I was really kind of questioning my role and the kind of people that I could serve just because of my price point. And, um, I decided to drop all the projects I was doing. I would put my font on hold so that I could launch an app to help um, small businesses put their businesses online. And um, right now, I think we're up to like about 140 vendors that we have like actively selling and stuff. So I kind of have switched over for the past maybe six months of this year into being a startup founder. Um, but out of more out of this feeling of like the fact that graphic design was always horrible and maybe it could be like helpful in this one instance this time. Um, and I, I'm trying to work out that experiment while I'm like also drawing type, I think. Um, I think type has helped me kind of separate the relationship that I've had with graphic design a little bit, like a little bit less of the romanticism is there. Um, but yeah, that's what I've been doing. I've been doing a lot of everything except fonts. I mentioned that I do different kind of things. And this year, because it, well, last year, because it has been so special, uh, it allowed singular focus because uh, most of the other projects I work with theaters and performing arts, uh, of course, that all has been canceled. So uh, uh, all the productions, uh, ballet, dance productions that I work on uh, have been, been stopped. The exhibition projects have been stopped and allowed focusing solely on type design. So for, for us, it has been, unusually productive year because of you know, can, uh, not uh, too much distraction concerning traveling uh, and having more time uh, at, the, at the desk, which is, uh, I, I haven't set, set as much on my, on, at my desk uh, this year, you know, in past 20 years. So it's been uh, quite different, productive, enjoyable. Um, I think Senia, you're on mute. Senia, your, <laughs> your microphone is off. <laughs> Whoops. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Um, has anyone else wanted to share about this year or do we want to? Yeah, I, I can Hi. go ahead. So, yeah, this year was, um, I was supposed to travel a lot, which obviously didn't happen. And so the first half of the year was relatively quiet because I also didn't feel like doing much anyways. Um, but then uh, the second half of the year went a little bit crazy. Um, 
in both good ways and bad. So we we had uh, the, the explosion in Beirut, which was a, a proper disaster for the country, and um, uh, to to raise funds for the victims, I started the Fontly Beirut project, which invited designers from everywhere to submit a glyph and uh, put put the fonts together and the glyphs together and then raise money and sell, you know, catalog and little postcards and manage to raise money. And that, that took a few months of work. Um, uh, and it was quite a nice way to cope with the horror of what was happening. So in a way, um, it was nice to be able to turn something so horrific into uh, yeah, like a national solidarity movement because we ended up with like 161 type designers from across the world submitting work. And, and it was a really nice message. And so that um, for me was like a very special kind of thing. Uh, not that I would ever want to experience such an explosion again. <laughs> I wasn't in Beirut, obviously, but like my family is there and um, yeah, my, my home and all of that. But um I think it showed just how wonderful the community is that we have, uh, that we are uh, supportive of one another and can come together so quickly to to be able to, you know, uh, show uh, solidarity and send messages of hope. And, and I think that's really beautiful. And uh, my thanks again for all the designers who contributed. What does it feel like um, working in such uh, like type design normally takes years or these are really long term slow projects um, as we're living in a more and more escalating new cycle world? How do you respond to that? Anyone? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the case of the Fontley Beirut, I gave designers four or five days to draw the one glyph and I put together the font in roughly one week and then launched the entire project within two weeks of, of the explosion. Uh, because when you want to fundraise, you have to be very quick on the ground. So even two weeks was too late uh, because most people who wanted to donate had already donated. Um, but uh, in, in general, the types of projects that you get uh, as a custom typeface, normally this is part of branding or part of a redesign of a newspaper or a TV channel or what else. And so uh, the kind of speed doesn't, is not the 24 o'clock, you know, 24 hour news cycle, you know, so we, we do have a little bit of time. Um, but the thing is that the technology today allows for quick turnarounds as well. We're not drawing things by hand. We're not kerning by hand. You know, the, the softwares that we use are um, advancing every year. And so type design as a process uh, from a technical point of view becomes faster. And of course, the more experience you have as a type designer, the faster you are able to design because your eyes are trained to see. Um, so we are able to quickly respond if, if necessary. But um, luckily, clients still understand that we need months to do the work rather than days or weeks. So, yes. I was recently doing a bit of research in a library and I was going through uh, old books and magazines from about 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I've been seeing these ads uh, and you can see different fashions and cars, obviously really dated. But the only, th the only thing which dated very little was type, which makes you realize how type resistant uh, type is compared to other disciplines especially fashion and industrial design, which is driven by trends and you know, cycles. Um, and, and it makes you feel kind of more relaxed that you know, what we're doing is really for, well, at least in, my, in our case, for longer term. You know, so uh, there, there is no expectation that this has to match you know, what that expectation are from season 2021, because what we're working on will be out much later and hope to stay on a, you know, have a really long shelf life. Uh, you know, having done it for some time, I know that, you know, most of typefaces become popular only about, you know, like a five, seven, you know, many years of use, using. Actually, time kind of increases the value of uh, some of the work, which is, again, exceptional compared to any other kind of this uh, area of design, which usually time kind of hurts the product. You know, you need to kind of sell it and promote it very, very quickly. And it type, it's other way around, you know, that the, the, the the more visibility, the more use, the, you know, the, the work acquires new meanings, a new context. 
So when it's seen in different environments, you know, it, it enriches the work. Um, and uh, it gives us more freedom, you know, to think like uh, that we're not doing it again for next month, uh, but for long term. So I, I would agree with all of that, except that there is situations where we need to be fast on the ground. Um, and I know we're not we're not going into politics now, but the the, the library collection that I released in, in November this past year, um, so on November three on election day, uh, under the theme of um, after the fall, which and the theme was protest, anger, and grief, and and a lot of the typefaces in it were either protest typefaces or typefaces related to uh, the exploration of grief. Uh, which was quite fitting for 2021. So I think there's there's a type of type design which has the long shelf life, but then there is the type of type design, well, the kind of type design, <laughs> uh, otherwise we're repeating the words too much, the kind of type design that is reacting to the environment we are living in and we are in the moment and we are feeling it, you know? So so there is, there is still that type of um, more, you know, quick, volatile display kind of typography that... Is, is born in the moment and is reacting to what we are seeing in day-to-day -day life, you know? So, so I think it, it is true that like, even with my own typefaces, I know that it takes, like if I release a typeface now, it will, I will not start to see it on the street for another three, four years at least, right? Um, but, but, but there is also power in, in recognizing um, the role that expressive typography can play uh, within the context of the the world we are living in today. And, and, and so I think there is a role for that as well. And, and I'm not gonna go more into politics than that. <laughs> My views are all on Twitter. So <laughs> here we talk type. <laughs> also no politics at all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So- okay, uh, got it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, that, I, I mean, I would love to talk politics anytime as, as anyone who follows me on Twitter knows, but uh, <laughs> of every 10 tweets, only one is design. <laughs> <笑> no、politics. いいですか、えっと、アジアの環境ではああの文字がたくさん漢字がたくさん必要なのでやっぱり早くあの展開しようとしてもなかなか作るのは難しいんですねこのタイミングでダンカーさんに訳してもらった方がいいですかはいそうですねあのところどころで切って訳するようにしておきます、はいそう、ミョーコは言うと、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日本は、日あのソースアンサンズみたいにその、えー、日中間あと英語,英語と,、えー、と合わさった大きなフォントを作ろうと思うと必然的にやっぱり時間がものすごくかかってしまうっていうことなんですだから社会のニーズに合わせてフォントを早く提供しようと思ってもなかなかそれがすることはできないんですけどやっぱりこうたくさんのパートナーを得てやっぱりその協力し合っていくっていうのがあの今後望まれるかなと思ってます。So,、um, Isha is saying that in the future,、um, the kind of multi language support that、um, fonts are going to have to offer is something that we all have to consider.、Um, for example, her work developing Source Sans, which I'm sure you know, is a, is a, a font developed by Adobe, which, is, which contains three extremely huge languages. It's got Chinese, Korean, and Japanese languages all in a single font.、Um, it's an amazing project. And、um, so, what Ryoko is saying that we're developing these types of fonts. Is impossible to do quickly.、Um, she said, but what's going to be needed in the future is for us to actually find the partners to work with to be able to include、um, multi language support in a single font. Okay.、Um, that can lead into, yeah, there's so much collaboration that happens with type design.、Um, what makes for a good collaboration for you?、Uh, anyone can feel this. Um, and is there someone that you haven't had a chance to collaborate with that you'd really want to? For me, I think that、um, because of the type of person that I am,、um, which is a bit of an indictment, but I think that I'm not really, I think that I need to work with people that have 
um, opposite traits to myself. So people whose ways of working kind of comp like anybody who is too similar to me, I mean, I'll just find them insufferable, right? Because I'm insufferable. Uh, I think like if I have to think about somebody, I am um, I like a dream collaboration would probably be with DJR. Um, that's just because of how long I've spent admiring his work, though. Uh, so collaboration, ことデザインとして合うかとか、あと相手のえっとデザインをリスペクトしていくっていうのがあの私の経験で大事かなと思いました。あ、ミオクスさんが、when Yeah, concerning uh, collaborations, uh, I myself, I'm usually actually traveling quite a bit. So for me, it's actually really nice to be in this meeting with people from all over the world, even though it's, it's uh, virtually. I've, uh, this year, last year, this time last year, I've been to Mexico City. So uh, next time, Sandra, I can come, I uh, hope to, to be able to say hi in person. And I've been to the Netherlands, I've been to London, and this year I had to unfortunately cancel my trip to Tokyo. And um, so I was uh, quite grounded here in Lucerne in a way, uh, which was unusual for me, but I had the possibility, I was very lucky that a big uh, commission at the beginning of the year and had the possibility to work on a really large project. And in that project, I could collaborate with uh, type designers that did different scripts from Latin and including also Japanese and Chinese. And it's been one of my big dreams to be able to do a project, including those scripts. And as I personally have a, a huge respect, as Ryoko said, that, um, when I look at the encoding, the uh, Japanese typeface hat, I thought that my job is uh, really like, a garden level compared to that. And um, so I think collaboration with typography for me is really interesting when it's um, in, in, in on a global scale and when you're able to combine different scripts with another and you also get to peek a little bit into with these different scripts into the mind of different designers and different mindsets when it comes to type design. And um, Again, with Japanese, I find it really fascinating because of the complexity of the projects. It's much more a, a, a huge collaborative effort. It's often just one designer. I, I love to talk about something uh, about the project. Um, Talk briefly about a collaborative project uh, here in Latin American because it's not just a thing we do in Mexico City. Um, the community in Latin America has been very active in this in this field of the typography. So we were in a collaborative project of the Letrastica project. It's a kind of collective here in Guadalajara in, in Mexico. So we are sever, were severe, several, several teams create eight phones for free use, uh, which the project turning out uh, to be a very entertaining a learning school. I want to share with you, all of you in the chat, I can put something in the chat, yes. Um, the Git, um, GitHub project, so you can see what we do. And everyone who wants to collaborate, improve and develop these free typographies, you can 
do that. Um, you can approach <laughs> and download and use and develop this project. Um, I feel pretty uh, pretty happy because Latin America and um, we work together a lot. Uh, we have a lot of friends uh, working on, on typography field, but at the same time, we try to learn uh, one from other, and we have a lot of, you know, interest in in the um, uh, in the develop, for example, typographies for um, native language here in Mexico or. Uh, uh, people work in Brazil, for example, working in, in original language and typography for that language and supporting and try to do support for, uh, for that language. So that kind of work, that kind of, of, um, of interest needs uh, professionals from different fields, for example, from the um, linguistics, you know, uh, we need native people who speak uh, their language and help us to develop their typographies, for example. So we have an amazing typographist here, for example, Manuel Lopez Rocha. He works with um, native language here in Mexico and he he share a lot her knowledge, his, his knowledge about that. So I just want to make a brief uh, so what we try to do here in Latin America and, and, and share with you this beautiful project. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Thank you. How do people feel about designing for, yeah, like designing for scripts or languages you don't read? How do you approach that process? How do you judge and evaluate when you have to for a competition? Um, can, yeah. Yeah, I, I would like to agree with that. <laughs> I mean, I there was a bit of uh, discussion over the summer, I think, or late late spring with regards to non-natives designing for languages and scripts that they don't read and they didn't grow up with. Um, and I think it's important to, uh, to recognize that if you are born in a country, you are not automatically a type designer. You have to study, you have to educate your eyes to learn to see the letter forms in ways that are different from when you learn them so that you can read because the process of designing type is different from the process of reading. And so there's a lot of education for us to become type designers, whether it is your native script or not. So there is always an advantage for a native designer, not because simply they are born into it, it's not a question of DNA, but it's a question of being, of growing up in the visual culture so that you, have, you are part of the collective memory of what posters and books and designs using these typefaces and this script look like. What is the word shape? What does it look? What does a normal word look like? You, you already have that, but it doesn't make you a good designer just because you have this memory, because it could be that you have it and you're just not able to use it to any good. So I think it's absolutely possible to be a designer designing a typeface for a script you did not grow up with or a language you don't even read, um, if you've done the work, if you've researched, if you've looked at what typefaces look like, what the calligraphy looks like, what the script system is like, and also taken the time to see the visual culture of that language and that script, what, what that looks like as well. So you need to do the work, you need to do the research. And if you're a good type designer, then you are able to make that leap. And so, there are no shortcuts in this. Just the fact if you are born in a country doesn't automatically make you a designer of that script. And at the same time, if you're not born in that country, there is no big impediment against you being able to design for it as long as you do the work. And, and so there are different views, of course, on that. But I, I always prefer to think that 
our DNA lottery, what we grew up with, what we, what, what we not grew up with, what we were given at birth should not impede our ability to work and, and to choose what we want to work. Of course, if you're not a good type designer, you're not good. That's, that's it, no? But there should not be any barri barriers on your ambition to design or to work or do anything just because you were born in a specific country or in a specific gender or in a specific race, right? So all of these things come together. It's all genetic lottery at the end of the day. And so I think it's important that we recognize that good type design requires research and effort and that we support that and that we are able to form structures of cooperation between people who are interested in good type design across the world so that we can all benefit from one another, but not to put hurdles in front of people who just want to work, right? So, so look for collaboration and cooperation rather than drawing borders between countries. That's at least my, my view on things. I, I completely agree with Nadine that, um, you know, type design is a practice-based discipline. You know, you need to practice a lot to have a better control. And uh, you can see people, you know, with their native scripts, they still struggle to define, to have solid control about the shapes that they're drawing, because, uh, you know, it is hard to expect that your first type is will be good. Uh, you know, it's first anything that will be good, you know, for your first book, for your first whatever, you know, you, 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 you create. So you need to kind of immerse yourself to, to practice, to allow yourself to make mistakes, to learn from these mistakes, to, uh, to engage in dialogues, to learn why some things work, why some things don't work. And uh, the thing, you know, when you start working with uh, a foreign writing script, uh, it's completely possible, but it takes even longer. So you need to allow plenty of time uh, to, to do it. Yeah. Um, but we've seen, you know, there are plenty of examples of uh, uh, outsiders making significant contribution because they don't take anything for granted. So actually they have to start from scratch, which can possibly be an advantage as well. Uh, it's, it has a lot of disadvantages too. Uh, again, the time is probably the biggest the disadvantage hurdle because the learning curve to get into designing Arabic or you know, Japanese or whatever uh, will be enormous. So you have to see it as an investment. You know, is it something you want to spend more time with? Again, expecting that your first type is will probably not be fantastic, but you know, the second one will be so much better because we'll benefit from all the work that you all the time that you put into it. And it's from there on, you will probably pre create something useful. In the same way how, you know, if you, if you choose any writing script, it will be the same process. Uh, you, will, you will slowly improve, you will have better control, you will be uh, able to create original answers. Um, and that's what we all uh, strive to do. It's, it's 100%. I mean, just to follow up on, on Peter's point of, of just how thorough the research is, uh, the, the, in my mind, one of the best examples of a designer designing for scripts they are not native to is Toshi Omagari. Uh, so Toshi is from Japan, but he's designed, I mean, he's won, award, he's, man, he's won many TDC awards and other awards for, for, for Latin, for Greek, for Cyrillic, for, you know, he's done so much. And, um, and, and like one example, uh, Toshi, I, I used to be his boss when I was at Monotype. Um, he, he wanted to design in Arabic, right? And, and he wanted to design a Rukha. And I had already started to design a Rukha for, for a project, a personal project. And, and I had looked at a few examples and started to draw. But when Toshi decided that he's going to do in Arabic, it was amazing the amount of research that he did. It was unbelievable how thorough he was and how many people he talked to. And even when I would give him feedback, he would be like, yeah, but that's what you think. Let me go talk to Kamal and let me go talk to this other person and this other person. And he was so thorough because he knew that it was something new to him and he needs to do the work. And this is why he wins awards for all these, you know, typefaces that he designs because he, he takes it seriously. And I think this, this is the type of uh, approach that we need to be supporting, that, that you do the work, you are thorough, and, and then, yeah, and then the TTC awards come. <laughs> えっと、仕事に取り組んでるんじゃないかなっていう予感がします。なのでそう、あの、彼の書体にこう魅力があったりとか、こう現れてくるんじゃないかなってちょっと思ってます。So we also saying that she's um well aware of she calls um she calls him it's interesting she calls him Toshikun, which is the uh, it's a very friendly way to call someone in in 
Japanese. It's not a it's not a cold, distant way of calling someone. She calls、Aww. him Toshikun, which is really friendly. <laughs> he said,、um, "Toshikun, it's it's very clear that he has an interest in the typefaces he's designed, and that interest ends up being reflected in the quality of the work that he's producing, which is why、um, she totally understands what you're saying, there, Nadine. She thinks he's great too." Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I agree with all of those things,、um, and I think that there's a、um, there's a certain. I think that the more interesting question is who gets to design these things at the la- like at the high levels. And who's in charge of the conversation around who's designing these things at the high levels? Because I think that when people are having these, I think a lot of the railing against people designing for scripts, for example, that they may not be from. I think a lot of that. I mean, I think it's a, a slightly immature argument, but I do think that it's coming from a place of wanting to be included inside of the conversation because a lot of the people who are Making these comments are people who are seeing, for example, inside of their industry or inside of the writing system that they or particularly might have an affinity for. They might be looking at the industry around it and being like, "Well, everybody who's designing for this writing system in a major way, so somebody who has a job, so somebody who is getting the money out of the system for it."、Um, I think that a lot of the argument is against the selection of those people because. For as long as those are the same people that are designing for those writing systems in the long term, the work won't really get given back to the people. So I, I do think that you can learn. You can like immerse yourself in a culture. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. But I do think that we should be in a. I think that we should be questioning a little bit who gets to design more than who is more than who is more than who. Is designing for what what writing system? I think that you should be able to design for whatever writing system you want. I mean, my I think probably I mean I've designed for a writing system that nobody will have a relationship with.、Um, but I do think that when we think about the industry around that, I think that there are some questions to be answered around who gets to be who is in a position to be lucky enough, for example, to do the right amount of research. To be able to produce a high quality font in a writing system that they're not familiar with, and is a person from the same space that they're writing in, perhaps as qualified, but just less qualified in the ways that we have our markers for.、Um, that's what I think the interest. That's what I think a lot of the root of the frustration with that conversation was coming from. I think the people who wanted to have it were a little bit angry at. I think, to be honest, at who was doing it in terms of like. At the Adobe's and the Microsoft and the Googles, you know,、um, but I do think that it's. I think it's something that I do. I think it's too limiting to say that you should be from a place to design for that writing system because it leaves out too many people who are genuinely curious and interesting and interested. And like, I feel like so much of design and what makes design fun and interesting to some people is this idea of something new. And I think that if we try to hold that back, design will suffer by and large. Um, if we try to restrict, you know, we restrict the Indian designers to drawing only Devanagari, for example,、um, I think that that would get a little bit boring with time. But I do think that we need to have the question about like why are、um, all the major ones white, for example. I'm not saying they are. I'm just, you know, that's my example. I'm I'm pretty really I really、uh, understand and I agree with you, but I would like to bring this issue to Latin America, for example.、Um, the native language in Latin America, all true, they are writing in Latin letters, but、uh, we have problems for several reasons.、Uh, some of them because the characters are not supported by Unicode or they do not have keyboards to write them. Um, because they are minority language, so there is a work in, work in progress technological, but also were related to the development and standardization of these languages. In, in these cases, it is necessary, for example, the interference、uh, with the government or, or agencies and integrate the community into it. So the technological issue or develop. Multi-language、uh, script typography, typographies is not just the issue. Is how ca- how can how, 
the people who can uh, write uh, in their own language if they don't have keyboards, for example. And they don't have keyboards because they don't have Unicode to to write. We have an, in, in Latin, in, 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 we have problems in, in Latin America and in the native language just for that kind of access of technology or we need to develop a lot of things. So, so we have a lot of a multi, um, uh, I don't know, we have a lot of problems with that and it's Latin characters. You know, it's it's, a, it's an issue, for example, one of them. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's like so yeah. many pieces of this work. Is that and one <laughs> <laughs> the thing is like it's a com like b because we're not in the same room you always need to like quiet a little bit just to make sure that someone who wants to yeah. speak has the opportunity because <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be rude yeah <laughs> but yeah sorry for getting political <laughs> we lasted for like 30, 40 minutes. So I know, I, I know. <laughs> that is uh, quite a. Uh, but but it, the thing is, like, it is important to recognize the. Uh, I think it's just a question of privilege in design. Who, yeah. who can afford to buy a Mac? Who can afford yeah. to pay for design education? Who can afford to buy all the books? And, like, I remember when I was. Um, at university, my my like I didn't come from a rich family. We my parents were barely able to pay tuition because it was so expensive. But like so, there was no leftover money basically to buy any of the good books, you know. And there was no internet at the time because that was forever ago. And so, like when I wanted to design, I just didn't have anything to look at. I just saw what the teacher showed for the those few like hour or so at, at school, and that's it. And then the state of graphic design in Lebanon was very poor at the time. So it was, yeah, that was it. But then I had friends who were able to buy the books and their designs looked so much better than mine because there was more maturity because their eyes were better trained because they had looked at good references of design. And so it's definitely something which is important to keep in mind. And, and this is why I think, uh, us as a community, especially it falls upon, upon those of us who have managed to, you know, climb the ladder up to, to make sure that we don't pull up the ladder behind us um, and that we establish ways to cooperate and give opportunities to people who might not have otherwise had these opportunities. And, and it's really, it, it is a duty really on, on, on any of us. To, to, to reach out and to, to create this type of opportunity. Otherwise, what's the point, right? The, the ladder is up. <laughs> and what we want is to continue, continue the path rather than close it behind us and shut the door. And I think beyond the economic limitations, not, not being able to afford some uh, equipment, you know, we work often with uh, you know, small linguistic community of indigenous uh, you know, people working with their, on their own languages. Often it's not a problem of money, it's just being having access to the right information, not, not being able to actually find out how things work, not knowing that you actually need to reach out to Unicode to, to, to make a proposal mm. to encode some things. Uh, when we tell them you know, how to do it, they're amazed. You know, like they always think that there's someone somewhere controlling these things and telling them that they actually have ability to contribute to, count, uh, to these efforts to encode their own language. Uh, to define their own keyboards is actually accessible to many people, except they need to be you know, told about this, you know, about these possibilities. Uh, and luckily, uh, you know, these kind of uh, meetings and presentations and the discussions allow uh, spreading more information. There's more and more information available everywhere. You know, like I think uh, if you do have the time, and I think that's another thing, you know, not everyone has the time to, because it, it is a luxury as well. Uh, you can find out you know, how things work. Uh, but sometimes you, you know it, you get fortunate that you you know learn from someone else, and it becomes much faster uh, to 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 make something you know happen. 
Uh, we, we worked uh, last year uh, on encoding some of the um, Aboriginal Canadian syllabics, which were not encoded, uh, you know, working on some of the index scripts. Again, people are amazed that they are like, that, so, well, you have to realize that m most of the scripts of about half of the world scripts are still not encoded. You know, so they're still unencoded, mm -hmm. like, uh, complete characters, uh, scripts, writing scripts. Not just single characters, uh, not missing characters, but you know, complete you know, writing systems which are still not part of it. Uh, and so there's still plenty of work. And if they're not encoded, means they're done, not digital fonts, and that's why there's no uh, uh, support in application. It's a whole you know, uh, chain of um, well workflow of you know how information can be processed and what everything is depends on everything else. Absolutely, and I think what we need to do is also recognize the technology gap and how we can close it between countries of, you know, more leading technological advancement rather than countries who are on the receiving end of, of technology. And uh, it's uh, like, so I, I lived, I've lived in Europe since 2002. And uh, every time, like after I had, so I, I had, you know, I studied at Reading and then I went back to Dubai for a little bit to teach and then went to Linotype in 2005. And since then I've been in, in Europe all of the time. And um, like when I was at Linotype, it was in a big foundry, you know, the latest technology gets discussed, you know, in the hallway. <laughs> and, and then I would go back to give presentations in Beirut or in Dubai or where else. And, and I would feel the technology gap that, that we would be talking about open type support and what else when I am in Germany and then I go back to, to, to Lebanon or, or Dubai or what else and we would be talking about the, does the computer support the Arabic, right? I mean, sometimes it's it's that shocking, that the, the difference. And sometimes it feels like there's a five-year gap or a 10-year gap. I, I think the, the, the gap is getting shorter and shorter um, in time. Like, so it's not as bad now as it was in 2005 when I moved to Germany, but, but there is still that gap. And, and so this is to, to Peter's point that sometimes people just need to know. And, and, and you'd think, yeah, but they can just Google. Yeah, but if the concept in their head doesn't exist, they wouldn't even know that there is, you know, the W3C or that there is the Unicode Consortium or that, you know, what these institutions are because they are far away from the, from the table. Right. It's almost it's like you, you don't have a seat at the table. And so you don't even know about the table. Right. I have some questions that are coming up. Would you like to hear them? Oh. Okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's say this person, uh, Daniel, um, I've been thinking of challenging myself and doing something like 36 days of type, but in Cyrillic. Do you think it's disrespectful if I do not speak Cyrillic? Well. We answered, no way, no? No, it's not. It's yeah. not it's but, but but it's Go ahead and do it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, no. the thing is that there's not no such thing as Cyrillic as a language. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. No. Well, we were trying to avoid that. No, but I think no, no. But I think Cyrillic can can support the various uh, different languages spoken yeah. in, in um, Asia and in Europe. And mm -hmm. um, I think if it's an experiment to get accustomed to um, a new script, I think it's quite interesting. I myself, um, I studied Russian for one year at a university in Switzerland. And during classes, I also had to um, learn to write handwriting in Cyrillic, which is looks kind of similar to Latin and it feels similar, but it's a very different um, works very different in handwriting. And for me, that was a really exciting experience. I mean, part as a typographer, part learning another language because my handwriting would literally look like my handwriting as a five-year-old because I had, you know, the motor skills to, to learn to write something new. And to get into that, I would, I would definitely also connect that to learning a language. If it's just about designing shapes, it's, it's much less interesting. 
I, I think it's 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 a good point to to talk about how do we show respect to a script that we don't know how to read in, right? I mean, we're not we we read the language, obviously not the script, but you know, uh, to that effect. And I, I think the to my mind, and we can all differ on this. If 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 I were to design a script uh, that I I don't know, and if if all, if all I did is just collect a few typefaces and tweaked things here and there, and then decided that now I know how to design in that script, I think that would be disrespectful. I think for me, that the first step would be to understand why the letter forms look the way they do and to look at the handwritten shapes first and understand the movement of the pen and the construction, and then look at the internal proportions look at the structures, look at the rhythm, and then see how this was transformed into type design, because that's how we see why shapes look the way they do, and then understand the different typographic variations of these structures and letter forms, and then eventually jump to the next step and see, okay, now I am able to draw in this script, you know? But like do the work so that we don't start with type design, at least, and, and this is why I'm saying we disagree. There, there will be people who will say, no, no, type design starts with type design. And there will be other people who say, no. And, and for me, I'm more in the, no, we need to understand the movement of the pen. It's not because we want to replicate it, but because it affects the nature of what we have in the end as a product. And so um, even if the end result is completely mechanical, but we need to start with the reason why letter forms look the way they do. And they were first written before they became typographic. Um, and, and type designers will disagree on this. That could get us another hour of disagreement. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I think basically what I'm trying to say is we, the, the first step in designing for a script is to understand why the letter forms look the way they do. So it's not just about tweaking the terminals or making it more contrasty or less contrasty. It's more about understanding the logic that breathes life into these letter forms and how, what can change and what cannot change. How do you break, how, like it's, it's like, like type design for me is always like the rubber band. You can expand and push and pull, but at some point it snaps. And type design, good type design doesn't let it snap because you can push and pull the design space, but at the end of the day, people need to read it. And so it's this understanding of how malleable the letter forms are that really gets us to be able to design. And so if we are, if we are really to design for something we don't know how to read, we need to know why does it look the way it does and then start. And so that for me would be how to pay respect to a script that I am not familiar with, understand its logic and why. And then when before I, we start to draw. When I was working on the Afaka script, um, there was like, so I had to collect a bunch of manuscripts and then kind of find the right symbol inside of a lot of them. And there was this one symbol for the sound for P and, um, and there were like varying shapes. It was kind of the same, but varying ones. And I wanted to figure out which one was the right one. And at that time, I was talking to Michael Everson, who is this Unicode linguistics pro. And um, he basically was telling me about the shape. He's like, yeah, that, that shape comes from a man peeing. It, it, it's literally the shape of a man. Like, and as soon as he said it, I knew which one was the right form. You know, because like I found the one that looked the most like a guy standing up. But you have peeing. to show it to us now. Um, I, I, no, I wish I had it. The glyph, not the man peeing, but the glyph. <laughs> no, I wish I wish I had it somewhere. Um, I could look for it. Um, but yeah, but it's I mean it's it's, it's a stick with a with a stream with like a little <laughs> curve and a stream coming out of it. Um, but yeah, and I think that that like that is a good example of like need of of where it's advantageous to kind of know the origins and, I, and where things come from. I, I have a question. Um, sure. The, the reading direction of the script, is it left to right or right to left? It's left to right, yeah. And, and the peeing right. direction, is it left to right as well? It's left to right <laughs> as well, yeah. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, because there's something in reading. <laughs> this is new. There's a new term, the peeing direction. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> because there's there's a term in reading called directional bias, which you get right. after one year of reading. So when you read in Latin, you read left to right, and the way you process the world goes from left to right. But if you oh, read in Arabic wow. or Hebrew, and only in those scripts, then you see the world from right to left. And so that's wow. the directional bias. Ooh. And so that's why I was asking. That's why, like, if you want to do, like, a dinner trick with people, if you tell them, um, draw a boy kicking the ball, uh, people who read primarily in Latin, so left to right, the boy, 
and then the ball. Uh, so the boy will kick the ball in the reading direction. Uh, and right. this was done in Italy, and then in in the Middle East, they were kicking the ball from right to left because that's the reading direction. Uh, so that's why oh. I was asking if the directional bias is yeah, no. also replicated it, in the yeah. peeing direction. It, it sure is. It sure is. <laughs> so peeing um, frontwards, not back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's peeing. Yeah, he's facing the wheel, not running from it. Oh, that's so funny. Uh, there's another question um, from Maria. She wants to know what book or websites would you recommend to follow for students who are attending universities in the deep Midwest of the US? <laughs> and are not always able to afford supplies and books. I mean, the, the good thing now is that we, we have the internet, right? So uh, spending a lot of time online and, and you know looking at, we're here for the TDC competition, right? Looking at right. past winners. This is, this is an excellent way to, to, to get to know what is the highest level of excellence in this, you know, uh, in this industry. And yeah, I would say reading as much as possible. There's also like a lot of YouTube videos of designers speaking and lecturing, and it's all for free. Uh, so that's another way to access education and from the best speakers and designers and practitioners in our field. Um, and, and you just need the time, which is a privilege, but it's, they are freely accessible. Or even looking at the TVC annual, you go through exactly. it and you can see what people have done because we have students that mm -hmm. enter either communication design or now with the student category in typeface design. And you can mm -hmm. see what students have done. You sometimes can't tell the difference. It's so yeah. amazing between mm -hmm. students and professionals. Um, I have somebody else that asked a question. Um, he had a problem getting online for this. He wanted me to ask about the eligibility of a new superfamily with lots of weights plus corresponding italics. That in the past was only one style, regular, no italics. Does that make sense? I thought you could have italics in everything when you have a superfamily. Am I wrong? Yeah, it, it's. I'm gonna what? Like the super family includes all the different styles, right? I mean, it's a super family at the end of the right. day. Right, and like yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, okay. you submit everything together, no? Right, that's what I thought. Okay, so that was all the questions. Noel, for the education question, you've been um, in thinking about teaching and learning and doing GT Academy, right? Do you want yeah, to feel um, there? I have I had a lot of time this year to um, stay at home. I mean, a lot of time I was just couldn't really go out so much. So usually I'm quite traveling quite a bit and and in different places. I don't have that much time, and um, it's been also last year ten years since I basically started the foundry, and I personally never really had. Uh, a quote-unquote proper education in type design. I never went to a school. And most of what I understand is, is basically just from observing and trying out and talking to people. And I thought being in Switzerland this year and um, not being able to go out um, made me think also more about what I'm actually doing. And then that combined with the lockdown in many places and schools closing, um, we decided with Grilly Type, me and with Grilly Type, to um, do two initiatives. One of them is um, people can send us their typefaces and we're giving them critique, uh, which we're doing on Instagram. And the other one that followed up on that project is we call GT Academy. It's like weekly tutorials where I'm trying to, in a very compressed form, writing down how I do type design. And I found it really interesting to put that in kind of a form. And then I also got quite obsessed the last two weeks over between Christmas and New Year. And I bought like this high of a stack of um, design books, um, mainly about Switzerland, because I was always curious about Swiss typography, but I, I never read any of the books I have. Like I stole the grid system from my university library once. I think that's the only one I possessed. And I took the time to like read really through that. And it was a really satis satisfying um, project for me. And it's also feels really satisfying to 
kind of put down my own thinking in writing and then share that with everyone so people can maybe learn from that. Um, I have another question that came up. As judges, what are you really looking for in this year's entries? In a world where everything under the sun has been done, what's the thing that would make you stop in your track? Huh. Is, is that someone trying to get an edge on winning? I know, yeah. <laughs> just draw it, draw it properly. It's too late anyway. Just stop it. It's right. not ethical to answer you this know, question. Like, it, it, yeah. Do it good. That's what will give you an edge if it's nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I would like to challenge though the notion that everything has been drawn that is under the sun. That, for one, that's only for Latin, even if we wanted to discuss, right? The other scripts, the, the sun shines on yeah. other scripts as well, right? Yeah. So, right. and those have not seen much sun yet. So, so we need more. But, but even when it comes to Latin, I think, I think we're in a rut um, when it comes to originality, to be fair. Uh, and it's, it's, in a way, it's a bit shocking because I don't think we've lived at a time where there were this many talented type designers alive and working. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing, the community that we have now. And yet, when you look at the design work that is being done, it's, it's good, but it's, we don't often see work that is groundbreaking. We, we see good craftsmanship. We see excellence in craftsmanship. We see excellence in the understanding of the letter forms, but we're not seeing the design space expand uh, in Latin, not, not a lot. Um, and, and I think this is because of how we look and how we talk about type design in Latin. Um, it's, it's because we, the entire categorization system of Latin is flawed when we talk about serif and sans serif. Why are we categorizing typefaces by the shoes, really? Because the serif is a very small detail in the typeface. It's not the raison d'etre of the typeface. It's not the only thing that exists. Other issues like structure, like contrast, like rhythm, like proportion, um, these are all very important. And, and yet, we, uh, even when we go into the subcategories, um, of you know uh, moderns and didons and and transitionals and and all of and old style uh, and then when you go to the sans serif and you have the grotesques and the geometric sans serifs and all of that we're we're discussing we're describing type design in a way which is very closed because we are describing rooms that are more or less defined as they are and and, and this limits our ability to expand that space because we're, the moment you say, I want to design a geometric sans serif, 90% of your decisions have been made because we know what geometric sans serifs look like. And, and, and I, I would argue that we need to change the terminology because words are very important. The words we use to describe typefaces define our ability to recognize what design spaces we have. And, and, and so I think this is, this is the flaw. And, and we, need to, we need to challenge that, and, and each in our different ways, because it, it cannot be that you have this many talented, unbelievably hardworking, amazing type designers, and our design space is becoming more crowded rather than becoming bigger. Because when you look at a lot of the new sans serifs, for example, they're sitting on top of each other. They're too close to one another. We cannot accept to live in such proximity between different typefaces. You barely tweak and it's a new design, supposedly, right? It, can, it cannot be. We, we need the space to get bigger, not to get more crowded. But there are many more type designers on the market who are working and, and who want to create and they have every right to do so. And so we need that. So the answer is, is that we need to expand the design space by challenging how we look at type design and how we talk about it and how we categorize rather than to just tweak a few things and say, I have a new typeface, you know? So it's, yeah, I, I don't know. I agree. Yeah, I, I agree with Nadine that uh, I, I think there's plenty of space for originality yeah. Um, yeah. In, in type design, not just in, you know, like uh, working with other scripts where there's plenty of work, you know, that uh, the work needs to be done, the foundation needs to be done because there, there just isn't enough typefaces. Exactly. Uh, but even in the most saturated field, the Latin, uh, there's still plenty of work. Uh, and I also agree that uh, most people are too kind of 
feeling they need to follow the possibilities what Glyph's app or Robofont or whatever they're using uh, is offering you. So they see like a, there's a weight axis so they integrate multiple weights. There's a weight axis to integrate multiple weights. I think that the design space is a lot bigger than the weight and width. I think you know, if you look at purpose, if you look at you know, what readers, you know, uh, type design is basically an agreement between reader and writer, uh, you know, someone who provides letters and a reader. And they may have completely different you know, needs, uh, what they need. You know, it can be distance, it can be expression, it can be you know, whatever you can imagine. So you know, your design axes are, are not something that you've seen to be created in the past, but it can be something that you know that you just observe the current needs of uh, what, what's happening. You know that you have a dialogue with the readers, that you you know that you observe what what's happening around in the world, uh, and uh, create some, some new work. Because I think the work that we admire is something that has been made uh, observing the world, uh, and now we're looking backwards and trying to replicate what our heroes have made instead of paying attention to what's happening around us. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I, I think that that's really, I really agree with what Peter just said. I think that a lot of my peers, like my peers, when I think about like, like what I think like early stage typeface designers, um, a lot of the values in terms of like, where do you want to be in your career? Like, I don't know many designers of my generation that, like if they had a choice, if there was a fork in the road and you could either help, you could either help this writing system, you're making the same amount of money. You can help this writing system um, for this community of people that were subjugated like a thousand years ago and they're just starting to recover and now they have time to get a writing system. Or you can make branding fonts for Pentagram. They're going to pick making branding fonts for Pentagram because that's where the visibility is. And I think that, I think that we've gotten type design into this, role of uh, so not celebrity but a kind of a focus on the aesthetics of the thing and when the aesthetics of the thing become more important than the value of the thing I think we will end up in a trap of making geometric sands because we want to see if we can make that geometric sands that's going to take you know like if like maybe we have the right one and I think that maybe the question should be why are we making geometric sands but the question isn't that it's like I'm going to make the next branding font for the next generation of startups you know and i think that um i think that for as long as that is where the value is that we're going to continue trying to be the next channel or the next garamond whichever one you want to be that day um like i think that that's where the value system is the value system just like peter said it remains in the past with our heroes but i think that the difference is that our heroes were breaking new ground a lot of them and i think that we're so kind of focused on the navel gazing of hoping that we can become popular or famous as typeface designers. And I'm talking about my generation specifically, that I think that the work, a lot of the work just won't be new, unfortunately, because they're not asking questions about their practice. They're asking questions about their position or their future. You know, it's not about the work. It's about what does the work mean to everybody else? And I, I'm not sure if that was always the case, but it's what I'm seeing now. And I think that um, when I listen to the kind of things that my friends are interested in, it's 90% revival. Like they think they're gonna fix a revival from 400 years ago. Like they're all trying to fix that revival from 400 years ago. And, and I think that what I would really love to hear is like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do some research on maybe like a writing system that I could like do some GitHub upstream pushes for, you know? But like, there's no, there isn't any, there isn't any accolade in that. There isn't like the value metrics of that are like totally off. Um, and I think that, yeah, like type design, I think we're, we have, we're suffering for the craft or the design in the craft because we're not really pursuing the things that I think make type design special. But, but we also shouldn't have to give up on, on making original branding typefaces. Like Frutiger was a signage typeface for Charles de Gaulle Airport, right? Mm -hmm. That's a very commercial mm -hmm. project. And, and so mm -hmm. I, I think so. Th there needs to be two things. I think you, you mentioned one of them. Basically, if I put it in a different way, that fork in the road, you can mm -hmm. either decide to look outside your window and observe life and then design, or you can open a specimen book and then design. And for me, I am yeah. always more interested in, in looking outside the window, right? Yeah. Um, and so, so there is that. But then when it comes to branding and all of that, the thing is like branding, like if, if we, we need to talk about the economics 
of being a type designer and how you make your money, right? If you, uh, you heard what Peter said, you've heard what I said, it takes several years before a typeface mm-hmm. becomes even popular. That's if you're already a well-known designer. If you're not a well-known designer, it might take even longer, right? And so it could be five years, six years before you start to see royalties coming in on a typeface that you spend one year designing or six months. And so when you invest in a library project, it's very difficult to pay the rent. But when you get a custom project coming in, especially if it's a big brand, then you can pay the rent for this month and probably for many more months to come. And so people Mm -hmm. are interested because of the nature of the the market and the way that we are able to pay our expenses. But, But the problem is that we that that we we are complicit in a way uh, as type designers in in allowing that that all of these branding typefaces are geometric sans serifs like you know that, that so one time and and i will just very briefly say we we had a pitch and we never pitched uh, but but we had a pitch and this was when i was type director at monotype and um, they wanted us to do this lifestyle uh, unique whatever and then of course, geometric sans serif. I was like, no, that's what you think you need. We're not going to do this. You're asking us to work for free anyways. I'm going to design, well, I'm going to direct the design <laughs> to what I think you need. And, and, and we didn't do a geometric sans serif. We did something else and we won the pitch anyways. And, and, and so I think there, there needs to be a little bit more guts on our side to say, you know what, mm-hmm. you're asking for a geometric sans serif. Everyone else has it. You want to be unique and then you're asking me to look exactly like the same like everybody else. It's, it's a problem. And also we need to educate that not, you know, if, if you follow the trend, you don't look any different from any of your competition. At the end of the day, you're failing in branding if you look like everybody else. So you know, we need a little bit more pushback, I think, and, and a deeper conversation and an acceptance that there, there needs to be more diversity in, in the styles we use, right? I mean, like how many more can, hope. can anyone draw? How, how, how many ways can you draw a circle? Like, Ask Pentagram, <laughs> they'll tell you. Yeah. yeah. They'll find a way. I, I, I like Pentagram. <laughs> I've worked with them, 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 but, we, you know, they do good work. <laughs> Yeah, but we, we need to push. We need to push. I think yeah. we need to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe um, Ryoko was about to say something. <laughs> yeah. So, it's a new, 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 時間のかかるフォントであっても、結構その Oh, hey. yeah. um, so this is going back to the original question, which is about how um, the judges are going to view new work or like what, what kind of work would surprise them during the judging. And uh, Ryoko Sun is saying that um, with technology in is, is quite advanced. And in Asia, of course, when you're dealing with a type design, there are lots of kanji or lots of characters that have to go into a single typeface. Um, and she said uh, it's, it's quite clear to see people who have just taken the easy road of um, just adjusting typefaces and those have actually taken the time to put a lot of effort into the development of a typeface and あの、先ほどそのナディンが言ったようにその手から生まれるっていう形をもう少し意識してるあのフォントが見たいと思います。今よりその昔のある味わいとか、そのコンピューターでつるっと簡単に作られた形ではなくて、そのよりそのコンピューターから離れてるみたいな形をあの開発していただけると結構面白い作品が生まれてくるんじゃないかなと思ってます。these days um you know we're very technology saturated um she said it would be very she would be surprised to see something which um which more focuses on a very analog way of producing fonts a very hand if if for some if in some way the typeface had some sort of very analog element that had gone right back to the roots of the original language itself not just not just looking at it on a font level she said that kind of thing to her um would 
definitely catch her attention. Um, and she thinks it's a, also an important thing, um, which is very similar to what、um, Nadim was talking about. その細い線から力がかかったこう太い線にこう変わっていく様とか込み入っているところはその視覚補正でえっと明るく見えるように調整するとかこうそういうところでそのタイプデザインっていう見方をあの発揮してほしいと思っています。So with、um, design of、um, Asian、um, characters, there are actually, as you know, a single character being, can be quite complex and have a lot of strokes in it. And she said, you know, if you're looking at things on like an illustrated data level, lines are actually quite simple. But when you go back to the way the actual characters are drawn, it depends on the strength of your hand as to how thick a stroke gets when you write it. So she said, to see that actually reflected in a font, like for example, to have a detail of a, a very fine, slender font that has a very light touch to it, the one that goes into a big, thick, heavy line, that kind of thing, that kind of attention to detail to each and every single line in a, in a, Typeface would probably catch your attention. That's my attention too now. <laughs> so, when、um, to jump on the people submitting、uh, their entries, so when they're submitting a typeface entry, they're not just handing over fonts, they're doing a specimen and doing a layout. How much does the design, the copywriting, how the, how the typeface is shown is going to affect how you perceive it and how you take it in? Oh, I don't want to be a victim of design. Like, I don't want somebody to design it so well that like, I'm tricked into thinking that this is a good font. I think I may be a little resistant, to be honest. I mean, that's just me.、Um, what I'm going to look for is like, I think nice words might actually、um, sway me, to be honest. I'm a real sucker for nice words, but、um, of a serendipitous in there. But,、um, but yeah, for me, like, I, like, personally, I would, I'm going to try to be paying as little attention to the packaging as I can. Like, if it gets in the way of me noticing the, like, the readability or the letter forms themselves, then yeah, that's like, really problematic. But、um, I'm trying to, I'm personally trying to avoid. Letting those be too determinant. Because then it comes down to who designs that, right? Not this, the typeface. Well, the presentation, first of all, needs to make sense. You know? So if, if the、mm-hmm. idea of a typeface is to, I don't know, if it's, if it's meant to work in small sizes, you know, the person should show、yeah. it in small sizes. If it's yeah, a display、yeah. typeface, you know, make it shine in big sizes. So often I see、uh, you know, type presented in unproductive,、uh, in Ways, you know, in a way that completely defeats the purpose of the typeface. That makes you wonder, like, that some, sometimes designers are just confused. They create something that claimed it works in a certain way, but they're showing a completely contradictory way of how, you know, what, what it does. And therefore, you see, for example, spacing and kerning of typeface is size specific. So if you create, create it for a certain size, you know, make it see that how, how well it works in certain sizes. Uh, and suddenly, you see, like, it's just not working so good when it's you know, in a different con- context.、Uh, the presentation of a typeface you know, for a type designer is usually outside of our control. So, this is a kind of rare occasion to control the context and how people see it,、uh, which you know, they should use it. You know, they should see like, what is the ideal way to, to, to see this, what, how they would like to see it themselves.、Uh, and you know, this will be the part of you know, the presentation, this is part of the story. You create a narrative, and you know, this is you, know, you look at shapes and you look at you know, like you connect it with what you see. So,、um, people should use their chances. Yeah, I agree. Sorry, could you say that again? Sorry. I'm going to say that again. 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 えー、とある程度の、ね、文字の小ささの、えー、とテキストをこういうふうに組むと思うんですけどディスプレイタイプだったら大きく
、そういうその用途がわからないものが結構あるかなと思っています。Right. Um, so, Ryoko is saying that they should be, as you're saying, Peter, they should、um, uh, use the font in the way it's supposed to be used. So, for example, font that's designed for text should be displayed in text format, and display fonts should be dis-、um, designed in a way that shows that there are display fonts. Yeah, I, I think it's、um, maybe to bring an anal- analogy here is、um, it's probably like tasting food, the presentation of the food, even though you're not going to judge it by mainly its looks, it ha- has a big influence on how you perceive the food. And I, even though I'm from Switzerland, I personally don't believe in neutrality when, you, when it comes to present typefaces. So personally, I think it, you. You, when you're judging a type design, of course, as a, someone that judges this, you have to be a bit careful not to let the presentation influence you too much, but I'm pretty convinced it will have an influence on how you perceive it. I just want to、um, say to the audience that we are like eight minutes or so from the end of this panel. So if you've been holding on to any questions or if any of this prompted anything,、uh, send, them in. send them in now. And then to the panelists,、um, I'm not sure. How, which can,、uh, whether to get into a can of worms or not.、Um, but there's also like, we've had a lot of conversations this year on what the role of type organizations should be or what the role of type organizations are. Is there anything that you guys would like to see、uh, TDC or other organizations doing more for the community or how?、Mm. Do you have any thoughts on what? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot about、uh, the typeface organizations need to、uh, open uh, more her, his arms to not just development countries,、um, you know, because here, for example, in Latin America, we have an、um, amazing and incredible talented people, but For example, this year,、uh, when we all the community can access to all these uh, workshops, uh, lectures online, you can see a lot and incredible. Amazing can,、uh, people from Latin America participated. So, when this kind of um, events happen, um, Were in person, it's more difficult for the people to go there. So I think we need to、uh, open、uh, the knowledge,、um, be more accessible with that. So I, I think a lot about that. It's my, it's my, my, my thing, Latin American, because I'm from, I'm from here, obviously. So I see the inequality, maybe it's.、Uh, Uh, uh, hard work, but this is, is true. You know? So, maybe、uh, the challenge for these、uh, organizations or is、uh, share, is, is my key word here. Yes. Can I say something then to that?、Um, the whole thing this past year has been horrible with the virus and what it's done. But what it did do, because of Zoom, Has opened this up that we、yes. are able to share with the world. We had a workshop with,、um, not a workshop, but Eric Speakerman opened his printing shop. We got to see.、Um, Ruben Fontana got the medal this year. So, though he couldn't come here, but he did speak from Argentina. So, we have been able to, to open up everything to the world. And I find that part very exciting. And I'm hoping that once we get back to some semblance of order, just being in the real world, that we still will have these Zoom meetings and things, have in person, but have meetings like this that can open up to the world. I think it's, it's that important. So I'll make sure I do tell that. 
to the board. <laughs> I think organizations get a lot of responsibility foisted on them for um, for things that honestly industries are in charge of. Like the industry, the type design industry is the thing that regulates who gets to be a part of it, not the TDC, for example. Right. Um, and I think that it's a lot easier for us to have those conversations because one, the organizations don't employ anyone. So it's kind of fine to piss them off. But I also think that we're not starting the conversation where it starts when we talk about people being mad at organizations for for example, not f- fixing a systematic inequality. Uh, I think that systematic inequality is gonna be there and the organizations will respond to the systems that they're a part of. But I think that the onus, in terms of the, a lot of the response that I see people, a lot of the responsibility that I see people foisting on organizations, I'm not talking about just the TBC, but I think that a lot of that responsibility is actually in the hands of organizations in the type world, for example, like Adobe and Monotype and Google, like a lot of the a lot of the answers that people are looking for in terms of like how do we open up the industry? The people with money are the ones that can solve those challenges, and I think that the question has to be asked: Is it in the is it in the is it in the larger industry's best interest, for example, to open it up, open itself up to more practitioners and to more practitioners from different spaces? Um, because we have to, like, if it isn't, then we have to ask why. But I think that until we investigate those things a little bit more aggressively and with a little bit more nuance and with a little bit more, to be honest, a little bit more objectivity, because I think it's really easy to shit on a nonprofit. Um, But yeah, I I do think that we have have this challenge of blaming the wrong wrong source for a problem that is pretty endemic. Um, But that's what I think of the organization blame. I think it's exposed the reality that it's not the organizations, it's just the organizations are everybody's most direct access to the industry. But I don't think that they're representative or I don't think that they're in a position, and I'm talking about the organizations like ARGA or TDC, I don't think that they are the ones that are in the positions to make the institutional change that I think people are clamoring for across the industries. I mean, speaking of um, inclusivity, currently there are no female designers, type designers at Monotype. Look at so that. it's not even a question of race, even, even women. There are no female type designers left at Monotype. And I know it's, women it's, draw type. Uh, it's crazy. So, uh, I know women draw type all the time. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, but I, I, think, like, I think you're right. Uh, we, the thing, we always, and so here I'm speaking from an international relations point of view, There is always the situation as is and as it should be. And sometimes we don't distinguish between the two because in an ideal scenario, these institutions that we value, who stand for excellence in typography and the best of type, like like TDC, like SOTA, like A-Type I, like this is the best of the best, right? This This is what we aspire to. You would think that these institutions would have the power to instigate change, to, to, to have, to have teeth basically, but they currently don't because they, because they depend on the memberships. They depend on, they, they, they are nonprofits. They don't have the economic cloud um, and, and they are not in a position to go to war against people who are actually implementing the problems mm-hmm. that we currently have. So it's a question of who has the power and who actually should have the power. So institutions like these associations should have more power, but they currently don't. But the question for us would be, how do we change that? And to change that, we need to empower these organizations. It is us as type designers, when we come together and we actively engage within these institutions, all of them, that we are able to have a louder voice. If we all think, I mean, going back, Finally, we go back to Georgia. Someone was saying today that for all of those people who thought my vote doesn't matter, well, now the result shows that your vote does matter. It's the same with type design. If we all say, ah, but these big institutions, what can I do? If we all take this approach, it will only stay as it is or it will get worse. But if we want these important institutions that we all care for and admire, we want them to have power, we need to engage with them so that we give them everything we have, right? So, so they, they cannot exist without our support. 
And, and so this is where we all need to come together to be able to change the balance of power within our, our industry for equality, for uh, dealing with issues of privilege, with issues of accessibility, all of these things. It, it will fall upon us as individuals in supporting those institutions that can make a difference. And, and for me, the one thing that I would like that we do more of is, is also discussing ethics and type design. I, I would like that we have these conversations because of the, all of the, like Gerard Unger, the late, unfortunately Gerard Unger, he one time told me all of this Me Too, that was before Me Too became something else, but he was complaining about all the Me Too designs, all of the typefaces that look like other typefaces. And someone else recently was, was saying that there used to be shame before when you created a typeface that looks too close to something else. And now it seems like there isn't. It's, we've, we've gone past that point and that's not good for all of us. And we, need, we sort of need to bring back the shame and, and, and to talk about the ethics and the respect to fellow type designers. If a living type designer has designed an award-winning typeface, we don't go make a copy of it, right? They're alive, <laughs> you, you can't do that, right? So, uh, yeah. When you, it's, said, it's, when you said ethics and type, I thought you meant like, oh, we're gonna talk about the fact that like type is inherently evil and is something <laughs> evil for for years. But no. no, no, yeah, we should also talk about copying work. We don't yeah. have that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. No, no. Wrapping that up on the high note of like, let's empower the organizations and everyone exactly. should yeah, sure. and submit and volunteer and try to get on the board. Um, but I'm now it looks to the hype. You, uh, <laughs> We're ending on the teaser to the other dystopic conversation. And um, yeah, if you join TDC, then you'll get to be part of all those in the future. Uh, but yeah, thank you everyone for such a, such a wonderful, wonderful conversation and for being here today. And thank you. And don't forget to enter you know, tomorrow. Yeah, um, yeah Friday, for sure. Design, <laughs> Good luck. Standing designs February 5th. So Enter so everybody on this panel could see your work. That would be exactly. Great. And if your if your S is like kind of upside down or your A is kind of like leaning a little bit too much, definitely submit. That's yes. like <laughs> yeah. And and don't worry, yeah. don't don't worry about yeah. impossible conversation. You have an edge on how you can actually. Don't be it. shy with your typography. <laughs> yes, yes. And don't worry yeah, about just... imposter syndrome when you think you're yeah, not good yeah. enough. No, no. Do it. Compete in any case because you never. You're good enough. You never just know. know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You yeah. never know. Well, thank Come you. Come join. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Mm -hmm. Stay well. Thank you, guys. Take and care. I'll see you guys thank in you. a few weeks. Okay. Bye, bye. Bye. Okay. bye nice everyone. to see you. Bye.